Would you take your Bibles, please? Turn with us to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We'll be looking at scriptures in chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. This will not be a deep sermon, but it will be a big picture sermon. And sometimes we don't see the forest for the trees. So I'd like to trace a theme that goes through the book of Ephesians, and it's a picture of a very important portion of the Christian life. We all need to know what we're going to look at today. So I want to challenge you. Keep your Bible open. Keep your heart open. Keep your mind open. And let the Holy Spirit speak to you this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you've been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit. And I want you to notice that word sit. He made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Did you notice they gave four descriptions of God's affection toward us? He is rich in mercy. Wonderful. He is great in love. He has exceeding riches of grace. And he has kindness that lasts through all the ages. Mercy, love, grace, kindness. That's the affection that God has for you. Life is not fair this side of heaven. But you can count on God's mercy. And you can count on God's love. And you can count on God's grace. And you can count on God's kindness. He loves us. And then in this passage, there were three statements about what God has done for us. And he did these things in his mercy, in his, his love, in his grace, in his kindness. And the first one is, in verse 4, or excuse me, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, number one, he made us alive together with Christ. Every one of us, before we trusted Christ, we were dead. Our bodies were alive, but our spirits, our souls, our inner being was dead to God. But praise God. The Holy Spirit convinced us that we were lost sinners. And when the Holy Spirit brought conviction to our lives, then we trusted Christ. And the moment we repented of our sins, and the moment we trusted Christ, we were brought to life. Eternal life does not begin when you die. Eternal life begins the moment you receive Christ. You have eternal life. I like that. Second thing God did for us, not only did he make us alive together with Christ, verse 6, he raised us up together. You say, well, that's the same thing. He raised me from death to life. That's part of it. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he was raised all the way up to heaven. He ascended. And not only have you been raised from the dead and made to be alive, but spiritually you have ascended with Christ. You say, I'm still here. Hang with me. Hang with me here. Notice what he says next. And he made us sit together in heavenly realms, in heavenly places, literally in the heavenlies. heavenlies. He made us, not he's going to make us, but he, past tense, made us. The day that we trusted Christ, 
the Father made us to be seated in the heavenlies. Now you find this word again back in chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 3 for just a second. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I like that. All the blessings of Christ are available because we have been seated with the Father in the heavenlies. Back in chapter 2, it says again in verse 6, He made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now that's the key. Say, what do you mean that's the key? More than 70 times, the Apostle Paul uses the phrase, in Christ. Christ. What does that mean? Here's part of what it means. The day that you got saved, Jesus put his Holy Spirit in you to indwell you. The Spirit of Christ is in you. The day that you trusted Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit that came to indwell you placed you in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the local church. I'm talking about Christ is the head and everyone who's saved is the body. And you were placed in Christ. Now, right now, Jesus is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. His Spirit is in us right here on earth. Right now, our bodies are here on earth, but spiritually... We're in Christ in heaven. You ever think about it that way? Let me say that again. Jesus bodily is at the right hand of the Father. He has one body. He can be at one place at one time. He's right next to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, position of power, the position of authority, position of great high priest. He's at the right hand of the Father but His Spirit is within us here. It's just the reverse for us. We are here, His Spirit is in us, and because of that, in Christ we are seated with Him next to the Father. Only saved people have a seat next to the Father. Only those who are in Christ Jesus. So that's wonderful. Well, what does it say about this? It says then in verse 6, He raised us up together, He made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in ages to come, not just in the age to come, but in plural, in ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, while we're here in this age and in this lifetime, we're here. He is in us, and He's given us all spiritual blessings, and He gives those to us through the Holy Spirit. But when we die and we go to be with the Lord, then we can be there for ages and ages and ages to come. This whole world is going to be destroyed by fire. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And in ages to come, we're still going to be at the right hand of the Father because we are in Christ Jesus. And for all those ages, what's he going to do? It says in verse 7, that in ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We get more grace and we get more kindness and we get love and we get more mercy, and God blesses us through eternity. That's a pretty good seat. The closest thing in the Old Testament to this is out of the book of Ruth. You remember the book of Ruth? In the book of Ruth, Ruth is a Moabite woman. She comes back to the land of Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi. She says, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. She turns her back on the God of the Moabites. She accepts the God of Israel. And now they come back, and they don't have anything to eat, but it's the time of harvest. She says to her mother-in-law, let me go glean among the gleaners. Naomi says, go ahead. just happens she's working in the field of a man named Boaz. Boaz means strong. 
He's a godly man. He's a good man. He's a picture of Jesus out of the Old Testament. And while she's working there, Boaz finds out about her, who she is. He's never seen her before. And he blesses her for taking refuge under the wings of God. But does something very unusual. The women who were gleaners had their table to eat lunch at. They're way over here. The men who were the harvesters, they had their table over here. And they're eating over there. At the head of the table is Boaz. And Boaz is so impressed with Ruth, this Moabite woman, that she's turned to God. He yells over to the women's table. And he says to Ruth, Come up here and sit by me. Eyebrows go up everywhere. She's a beautiful young woman. He's old enough to be her daddy. And eyebrows go up everywhere. And he says, sit by me and let me feed you. And that's a picture. She's a picture of believers. She's a picture of the church. He's the picture of Christ saying, come up and sit with me. And everyone who's saved has that same call. We are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. Amen? Now, once you've been seated, that's not the end. That's the beginning. The seating is where it begins. But look at chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says this, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling. You see that word walk? All translations translate that word literally except the New International Version. And they were worried that people wouldn't understand it, so they translated the word walk, and they translated it with live your life. Your walk is your daily lifestyle. Your walk, let me repeat this. Your walk is your daily lifestyle. Now, in America today, we've got a lot of people trying to live a lot of ungodly lifestyles, don't we? But Christians are called to walk a Christ-like, godly lifestyle because we've been seated with Christ and we have the Spirit within us, now we can live a lifestyle that pleases God. And Paul says the first thing to do to walk the walk and live the lifestyle that pleases God is walk worthy of your calling with which you were called. He says in verse 2, with all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. That's a picture of the actions of Christ, the character of Christ. Walk in humility, walk in love, walk bearing up under the pressures and the suffering. Walk worthy of your calling. Humble yourself. Be obedient to God's call upon your life. But number two, he says in verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You cannot walk worthy of your calling if you're not walking to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Notice it says, in the bond of peace, and that's very important. If you're going to maintain the unity of the Spirit, you've got to work hard at it. Satan loves to destroy unity in churches. Satan loves to destroy unity in families. Satan loves to destroy unity in nations. Satan loves to destroy unity anywhere, any way, and he doesn't care how dirty he gets to do it, does he? So if we're going to strive, if we're going to endeavor to maintain the unity of the Spirit, first thing we have to do is we have to walk in peace with God. We have peace with God because we've been saved. But when we start walking like the world, it disrupts that fellowship with God, doesn't it? 
when we fall into old sins, it disrupts that peace with God. It hinders our prayer life. It keeps us from having that fellowship with God that we need to be walking in. But once we maintain that peace with God in our daily walk, then we have to really work at maintaining peace with God with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if I were to ask you right now, are there some people at Rye Hill Baptist Church that are really easy to love? Wouldn't you say there are? But don't answer this one out loud. If I were to ask you, is there somebody at Rye Hill Baptist Church that you really had to work hard to love them? If there's not, you're different than any church I've ever seen. <laughs> there are some people that are probably God's people, sometimes I wonder, that are really hard to love, aren't there? You have to work to maintain peace in the body of Christ. You've got to have peace with God first, but then you've got to work to maintain peace in the body. And if we don't work to do that, we're not walking worthy of our calling. Now to help us understand this, he tells us in the next few verses, there's one body, there's one spirit, just as you're called one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who's above all, through all, and in you all. We share a lot of things that are the same if we're saved, aren't, don't we? But we also share differences. Look at verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore he says, when he sit on high, let captivity captive. He gave gifts to men. God put gifts in you that make you unique. We are not all alike. We are alike in some ways, and we are different in other ways, and we have to be willing to say, I can love you even though you're different. And let our gifts work together. We have to work hard to walk worthy of our calling. He's going to use his word a second time. Look at chapter 4, verse 17. Chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, I say, and I testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. The Gentiles who haven't been saved. The unbelieving Gentiles. Those who believe in false gods or those who believe in no gods, but people who do not believe in the true God. And God's people are to be different. We know God, we've been seated with Christ, we have the Spirit in us, we've been gifted by the Spirit, we must walk worthy of our calling, and we must not walk like the world. Wow. He says, verse 18, verse 17 again, that you no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with ungreediness. Wow. Our nation is full of people whose minds are dark. It's full of people whose bodies have been given over to sin. And we must be different. We must love them in spite of their sin. But we must not join them in their sin. We must not walk like the Gentiles. So Paul gives an illustration of how to do this. Look at verse 20. But you've not so learned Christ. If indeed you've heard him, been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, your former lifestyle, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust, 
and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And he says, in order to not walk like the Gentiles, every day when you get up, you have to decide what you're going to wear. Don't put on the old sin nature when you get up in the morning. Instead, put on the clothing of the new man in Christ. So he explains this in verse 25. Therefore put away lying, let each man speak truth. Verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him that has, has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good. He says, take those old sinful habits and don't put them on that day. Leave them off. And put on that new man in Christ daily so you won't walk like the Gentiles. Third time he uses the word walk. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God with a sweet-smelling aroma. How many of you have pictures in your photo albums of either your children or your grandchildren when they were like 18 months old, two years old, three or four years old, and they got into your closet, and the little boys got their daddy's shoes, and the little girls got their mama's high heels, and they put them on, and they walk around. Why are they doing that? They want to be like mom and dad. And once you're saved, you want to be like your heavenly father. But instead of putting shoes on, you know what we put on? We put on agape love. We put on the love of Christ, the love of God. It says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us. That's agape love. And what is agape love? You know what it is. Agape love always pleases God. Agape love always does what's best for the person who's loved. Agape love, it's, it's eternal. It's forever. Agape love is sacrificial. Agape love is inseparable. Nothing can separate us from agape love. And every born-again Christian is called to walk in agape love. So we walk worthy of our calling. We don't walk like the Gentiles. We walk in agape love. And here's the fourth one. Look at chapter 5, verse 8. For you were once darkness, but you're now light in the world. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. How do you let your light shine? Jesus said, let your, let your light so shine that they may see your good works. But these good works are done in goodness. They're done in righteousness. They're done in truth. And so Christians are called to walk in the light, not in the darkness. And it says in verse 11, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Any time a child of God walks in light, the light shines in the darkness of this world. And our world is full of darkness. And when the light shines in the darkness, you get two reactions. There are those who are drawn to the light and who will come to Christ. And then there are those who see the light and they despise the light and they hate the light because their minds are so full of darkness. Don't be surprised when you walk in the light if the world hates you. But there are those in the world who will be drawn to the light of the world, Jesus Christ, if we'll let our light shine. And then one last time, he uses the word walk. Look at chapter 5, verse 15. Chapter 5, verse 15. 
See then that you walk circumspectly. Isn't that quite a word? Circumspectly. Now, years ago, if someone was considered circumspect, they were neat, they were tidy, they were fastidious, they were squeaky clean. That's not what this means. This is using the word circumspectly, literally. It's two Latin words put together. The word circum means circle in every direction. The word speckly comes from spectacles, looking. And literally the word means that as you go through life, you are spiritually aware of everything that's happening around you. You are spiritually aware where God is working. You are spiritually aware where Satan is attacking. You are spiritually aware where the Spirit wants to lead you to speak to someone. You are spiritually aware of all your circumstances around you. Wouldn't it be good if God's people would walk circumspectly? He says then, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. That if you're going to walk circumspectly, you've got to use wisdom. Wisdom from above. God's wisdom. Not earthly wisdom, but heavenly wisdom. I'm always reminded of Jesus' great parable. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The wise man built his house on the rock. And the rock is the teachings of Jesus Christ. The wise man walks circumspectly and he walks doing the teachings of Christ. Then he says, understand what the will of the Lord is. He says this, redeeming the time. It takes wisdom to redeem the time. We live, you have the same number of hours a day that I have. You have to buy them back to use them for God, don't you? The world will take up all your time if you let it. The TV will take up all your time if you let it. The video games will take up all your time if you let them. You have to pay the price to redeem the time so that you can walk circumspectly. He says, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. I don't have to tell you that. We know they're evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. If you walk circumspectly, you walk in the Spirit. You allow the Spirit to control you. And you will treat your brothers and sisters in Christ with encouragement. And you'll treat them with mutual submission. And you'll treat God with singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. And you'll always give thanks in all things to God. And according to the book of Acts, toward lost people, you will have confidence in sharing the gospel. So we have to walk circumspectly. So we start out with seating, and we got five teachings on how to walk. One more teaching. Go to chapter 6. Let's start in verse 10. Chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Not by accident. This comes in the last chapter of the book. You cannot take a stand for Christ if you're not going to walk with. If you're not going to do the walking, you cannot take the stand. The walking is a prerequisite to standing. The seating is a prerequisite to walking. They must come in the proper order. You're seated. You learn to walk. Now you do spiritual battle. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the schemes of the devil, literally the methods of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual armies of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we've got to stand against Satan. We've got to stand against the forces of Satan. We've got to stand on the evil day, and we stand by putting on the armor of God and doing warfare. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation. First five parts of the armor are defensive. You're going to do spiritual warfare, you've got to put the armor on. If you only put on three pieces of armor, you've got two places Satan will attack you. You've got to put on all five pieces. But finally, if you're going to do spiritual warfare, you have two offensive weapons. Here they are. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Our two weapons are the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. Many Christians got led astray in the past 25, 30 years. They got led into thinking that what we have to do to make our nation Moral is pass laws. Get good government. God never uses that approach in the Bible, does he? Did the Apostle Paul go around worrying whether somebody was going to be the king or somebody's going to be the next governor? No, he did not. He used the two weapons that God gave him he used the power of the Word of God, and he used praying in the Spirit. And there's only one thing that can change our nation. There's only one thing that can strengthen our churches. That's God's people walking the walk and fighting the fight with the sword of the Spirit and with the Word of God. That's the only thing the Word promises us will work. How well you walk in the walk. A lot of Christians can talk the talk. We know the church lingo. We can talk a good game. But how many Christians are walking the walk and how many Christians are fighting the good fight? Father, I pray you'd speak to all of us here today. Lord, I pray you'd speak first to believers. I pray that you would open up our eyes to see where we're falling short. Lord, help us to see that we can walk in the power of the Spirit. We can walk and wage warfare and stand against Satan if we'll walk with you and take that stand. Lord, I pray you strengthen us. I pray for anyone that's here today whose mind has been darkened by sin and they've not yet trusted Christ. They haven't been seated with Christ. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring conviction, that you'll draw them to you, that they'll be raised from death to life today. Know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Lord, bless this invitation. May your will be done, nothing more, nothing less than what you desire for our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.